Hey guys, this is Christopher Parham again, um, known as IceQ57 on the Endless Fear Forum, and I'm going to take this podcast in a different direction. I'm going to kind of, instead of focusing on electric bikes and stuff like that, I'm going to uh, do this podcast on my Chevy Volt, and hopefully I can interview some other people that own other cars like the Prius, the Insight. Uh, I know somebody that owns a city car. Um, I know somebody that owns a Tesla, a Nissan Leaf. So hopefully I can get them on and have them uh, talk about their vehicle. This is podcast number 14. So I'm uh, kind of getting up there in numbers and I'm just trying to change the content a little bit. My outline for this podcast will pretty much will be based on the Wikipedia page. I'm going to pull some facts from it and then also comment and comment my experience um, whenever I can on certain topics within the outline that I'm following. All right, the Chevy Volt was kind of a concept car that started back in 2008 and Chevy was trying to create a, a electric vehicle or extended range vehicle and so they had been working on the Chevy Volt which is also uh, named a few other things. It's named the Holden in Australia. It's um, named the Opel, Opel in Europe. It's, of course, it's a Chevy Volt here in America. And I think there's one other model that, that I can't even pronounce, but it's, it's sold under four different, um, four different names. This car is a five-door hatchback. So it, the front part of the car is like a regular sedan, although it's like a compact sedan so it's you know if you're expecting a whole lot of leg room leg room or something like that this isn't the car if you're in the front seat and have the seats all the way back yet yeah, it's fine for the the passengers in the front the ones in the rear aren't so lucky you know you can find that happy medium where you, you know scoot the seats up a little bit and you're not too cramped up front and they have plenty of room in the back but still it's not like a full body sedan the car looks almost like a full body sedan but it's not and then the trunk area the the back hatch is a respectable size like i would you know we recently went on a trip and we were able to fit um three full length duffel bags in the rear although you know when you close the hatch the hatch was closing on the luggage and then that also blocked a little bit of the view in the rear view but you know it can you can pack some luggage in the car and go on a decent trip and not have too much hassle and still have four passengers and all of their luggage it was built on this gasoline sister car the chevy cruise so they really didn't go into too much redesigning for it now the original concept model the volt versus what it is now those are two drastically different cars i mean as far as the the design i actually prefer the older design better but then again i'm actually kind of glad they switched over the design because i can't really see myself getting in and out of the the older pre-production uh concept model too easily because it's like i said it really is a smaller vehicle like I said, i'm a big guy it fits me but it's it's i wouldn't say it's a challenge to where i got to squeeze in the car but it's um it's definitely a lot, not like other cars where, you know, I get in and out with these. I'm used to big body cars and um, I was spoiled for a few years and had a big body car. But um, I pulled the trigger on this just solely because of the price that I bought it at. I bought it at an extremely good price, but I'll, I'll get to it later. Now I'm just going to go down to the specifications of everything. The motor in here is a 111 kilowatt motor that's capable of producing about 149 horsepower. But also, the, it has a gasoline engine, which is a four cylinder gasoline engine, which can produce the equivalent of 55 kilowatts or otherwise 74, 75 horsepower. Um, it doesn't have a transmission per se. I mean, it has one, but it doesn't have one. Um, it's almost essentially is a fixed gear so you not gonna really feel any shifting or anything coming from the car even when it transitions between gas and electric the car is so technically supposedly powered purely, purely electric and so there's only rare instances where the 
the gas motor may be directly coupled to the output of the transmission it's very it's very rare instances that it happens but most of the time the the gasoline motor spins the generator and the generator provides electricity to the motor controller which provides electricity to the the to the electric motor so it's a series hybrid and just rare instances the gasoline may decouple from you know decouple from the generator and actually drive the wheels under certain conditions really haven't told us what conditions though decoupling coupling happens so it's i can't really comment on it because i really don't understand because it's saying that after a certain speed it'll do this and then so is it doing it every time after a certain speed or is it just under certain conditions or under certain loads or anything i i really can't comment in wikipedia and the research the other research sites that have information on the vote really don't tell you how it couples and decouples and at what speeds or whatever but going on to the battery the battery in my model i have a 2012 and it has a 16 kilowatt hour battery now the way that the chevy volt uses the battery it kind of does like the 80 20 thing it doesn't allow it to get to full charge and it doesn't allow it to fully discharge um, but there is an exception to that rule it does allow you to do a deeper discharge only when you depleted the 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 ev range power you ran out of gas then it has like a four three to four mile limp home mode but even still it doesn't delete deplete the battery fully and so the what that translates to is there's only about 10 a little bit over 10 kilowatt hours usable using that 80 20 split to where it tries to keep it in the butter zone to give so it so the car can have that um battery lifetime that you know that where the battery pack will last eight to ten years without having it without it having to be replaced or losing more than 10 percent of its capacity so even after all of this the battery shouldn't just give out you know it should last the eight to ten years and only have a ten percent loss of capacity so that means the car is then dead in the water you can still continue to use it it just would be at a slightly reduced capacity now the battery in these uh, uh chevy volts is one made by lg kim um they actually had several different contracts but they decided to go with lg kim um which i mean just simply short lg and um so the battery pack in the car is a t-shaped um it goes down from the front of the car down through the center console of the car and then it tees out in the rear and the battery is 360 volts and 45 amp hours and so i believe the cells are 15 amp hours a piece with three in parallel uh, and there of course there are several modules like like in other vehicles now the total ev range on this battery um i've had it as low as 28 and as high as 45 but it greatly depends on your driving style and around my area um i have a lot of hills but once i get to the other side of town i start getting a lot better mileage sometimes four to five miles a kilowatt hour so um, but on my side of town, I'm usually in the three to three and a half because I pull a lot of heels. The the display in the car, it, it tells you your range based on your driving history. So if you've been really, really good in the past, you'll slowly start seeing higher and higher numbers. But if you've just been straight dogging it out, it'll just say like, oh, you have 30, 30 miles available, 32 miles available. But um, yeah, after I drive, pretty well and pretty respectable i've seen as high as 38 39 but it sort of goes on the average because like i said i know i've seen I've, I've rode as high as 45 it does some type of averaging where like i said i guess it averages the last five rides or something and that's how it gives you the um gives you the estimated range on the dash now going over into the um the gas range is a four cylinder engine and it uses premium octane fuel it can use lower octane but you'll take you'll have a significant hit on miles per gallon 
and the miles per gallon varies on this car of course like i said if you're using a premium fuel the miles per gallon on this vehicle range is great it seems like in level terrain it seems like it uses more gas the more level the terrain is and so i've seen see my gas tank as low as 32 33 miles per gallon but on the other end when you have the terrain it's, but it seems like in hillier terrain it seems like it does better and i've gotten up to about 38 39 there are some people that drive the car more gingerly and i've seen 41 42 of course they're doing less than 60 miles an hour whenever i'm doing highway traveling i just normally set the cruise to 70 75 maybe 80 miles an hour i stay in atlanta and i went up to ohio and i was getting 38 39 miles a gallon going up to ohio but going down to uh savannah georgia I always consistently get 35, 34, 33 miles per gallon doing that route. And the only thing that I can think of is just the elevation changes and how I'm probably using a lot more regen and the gasoline motor is coasting. One of the things about the gasoline motor, especially in uh, certain terrains, you hear it rev up a lot, uh, especially if you're pulling a hill or you or you're using an accelerator a lot, or you're passing somebody, you you will kind of, I guess you will hear the engine redlining trying to generate all of that power. And I noticed that there's two different driving modes. There's one driving mode where you let the battery deplete all the way empty, and then it just switches over to, to gas. And that one, it seems like it uses a lot more fuel because the gasoline motor is turning the generator and is having to supply all the power for the vehicle well there's also another mode that performs a lot better i think and i get a lot better gas mileage and this is the mountain mode the mountain mode what it does it allows you to discharge your battery to a set threshold basically a discharge to about 40 to 45 percent state of charge and so what this allows it allows the car to have power on tap so that if you need to accelerate if you need to climb longer grades or 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 whatever you have the power available because there is a huge difference between the gasoline motor only being able to supply 75 horsepower and then you having the battery pack there to supplement what the gasoline motor can't produce so uh, when you're looking at the display in the car when you're pulling hills and you're in mountain mode you'll see that oh the gasoline engine will be providing most of the power and then you'll see the screen switch over to to gasoline and battery power and it's pulling both from both of them at the same time and then of course once you crest the hill and if the car is in the right mode or gear or whatever you can kind of recoup some of that energy back that you use to climb that hill and this came in very very handy when uh i went to gatlinburg tennessee and there's two ways to get to gatlinburg there's one if you take 75 north up into tennessee up to severville or pigeon forge it's much quicker to go that way it's less of a strain on the car but i decided to take the scenic route where you take more windy roads and the elevation changes are just redonkulous you know they're they're, they're stupid stupid grade changes and i really took this path to test the vehicle because one the vehicle was fully loaded it was me my wife and another couple and so I would say the combined weight with just the people alone were, was, I would say around eight to 900 pounds. I would say about 800, yeah, eight to 900 pounds of just person mass of body mass in the car, not to mention probably another 150 pounds with luggage and then also the fuel. And so it was, fine it, it, the car operated fine for the most part but you once you start climbing those elevation uh those steep steep grades and changing the elevation gra drastically like when you're looking at the road and you having to tilt your head up to look at how how steep the grade is uh the car performed pretty well up to a certain extent uh and i say this because again this shows how 
weak the gasoline motor is. It's not like terribly weak because, I mean, there are other cars that have three-cylinder or four-cylinder motors that don't even produce 100 horsepower that, you know, that struggle with a lot of every everyday things. I had a Scion XB and it barely produced 105 horsepower on its four-cylinder engine. So, um, I've driven four-cylinder cars that didn't have a lot of power. So, um, this wasn't new to me, but it seemed like whenever I was climbing these grades, there was like a wall that I was hitting around the 40 to 45 mile per hour range. And so, one, I think is due just to the grade in general, the weight in the car and everything. The air is thinner up there because I've took I've taken another vehicle up there that was just so it was a V6 car that was solely gas and some of the same areas that I was struggling. Um, it was like I was having to drop in drop the car into first or second gear to climb some of these hills and I wasn't really gaining a lot of speed so you can tell that the motor was like redlining trying to produce the power uh, in both vehicles in my vote and in my previous vehicle where I took the same route so there's an imaginary 40 45 mile per hour wall that the that the engine is hitting and you just hear the engine redlining trying to uh, keep up keep up enough energy or generate enough, hor enough energy or horsepower to climb this grade but here's the kicker. It's not that the car is anemic or underpowered, because like I said, there is that mountain mode where it, it holds on to a certain amount of electrical uh, electric range to assist the gas motor. So after that 40, 45 mile per hour, if I needed a quick burst, all I had to do was press the gas pedal down a little bit further. But the unsettling thing about that is the car does something weird where it decouples that's where that coupling, de coupling and decoupling thing that I told you about earlier, it seems like it's on gas and it disengages for like a fraction of a second to where you feel like a sudden loss of power. And then it automatically starts blending the battery and the gas together. And so once it does that, that means full power is available to the motor. So instead of you having just uh, 75 horsepower at your disposal. It switches over to uh, using some of that electric range, to some of that electric power or electric battery power and coupling it with the gas. And so all of a sudden you have this surge of torque and power. Yeah, on gas only it's anemic, but once you use that blended mode, it was just, it was flying up the hills. But the thing is that the driving was so technical to where you wanted that burst of power to give you an extra boost of speed, but there's no way that you could sustain that because it was just pulling so hard. And that's one of the things about electric motors. They pull really, really hard and they have a lot of torque when um, gasoline motors are a little bit more predictable and their power bands are a little bit more predictable. You don't have a lot of power at lower RPMs on the gas motor, so you have to rev it up. Or like I said, put the put the car in a lower gear to where you can build up that horsepower to have, you know, to have the power that you need to climb these grades. So by no means the car is anemic. It, it puts on that persona that is weak. When you feel it in the gas pedal and you're modulating your foot to, you know, give you speed, you feel that wall. It's not, and it's an imaginary wall, but you feel the loss of power and it's like you're hesitant to push it any harder because you feel the car is struggling but if you just go ahead and press the pedal on down that thing will switch over into that blended mode where it's pulling from the battery and the gas and it just rockets up the hill like there's like nothing is there so that's one thing that I like about the car is it's not weak by any means it's spunky you just have to you know trust that the power is there you gotta believe you know <laughs> And so it was, it was an interesting trip power climbing these hills, but on the other side, you know, there's the, the grades coming down. I mean, there, there, there's the steep hills going down. And so what tends to happen is, uh, the car has regenerative braking. It has regenerative braking through two or three different means in regular drive. There's a really, really light regenerative braking where it still allows the car to coast normally like a regular car but it's still recuperating energy 
and it has an ever so slight drag on the car. I was coming down the mountains going going to Gatlinburg on my way into Gatlinburg. Drive didn't provide enough braking, regenerative braking. Like if I were just to coast down a hill and drive, it would pretty much be a runaway car. It'll still have some regenerative braking or drag, but it'll still essentially be a runaway car. But on the other hand, if I put the car in the low, which it has more aggressive regenerative braking. Some of the grades were steep enough to where it was providing a perfect amount of drag to where you're just lightly hitting the accelerator pedal just to kind of keep pace with other cars. But regenerative braking could stop you going down these grades. It could just slow you all the way down to 5, 10 miles an hour without you hitting the brake. So that's a, that's a good thing about the regenerative braking in a lot of situations. A lot of the times with regenerative braking, if you plan how you're going to stop the vehicle you don't have to hit the bricks until like the last second when you're of just a few feet away from the car so you know a lot of times i just throw it in the low and coast to the light and just gently put my foot on the brake whenever i approach a car uh but going down hills it's almost like there isn't a set it's like on the electric bikes, the faster you go the harder that it kind of breaks and then the slower you go the braking effect isn't that great and sort of sort of the same thing at lower speeds the braking isn't pronounced but at higher speeds it kind of is but then again I can't even hold the car to that to that explanation because it just seems like in different scenarios and it could be also with the state of charge of the battery and all of that but in different scenarios when you're driving in low and you're depending on that regenerative braking you can brake once and it'll be like oh that was a perfect braking experience or regenerative or perfect use of regenerative braking and then you go to call on it again and you like it feels kind of soft and weak and it's not stopping me like i like i want so it's not set or defined so i'm pretty sure there's something going on in the computer to where it's it's staying in a certain range, but depending, I guess, depending on the speed, the state of charge or the battery and everything, it can be strong and it can be weak. So there may be a few times where you might have to tap on the brakes, uh, but it's not, it's not all the time. Like I said, I'm with 50, I got like 47,000 miles on the car and the brake pads look brand new and so like i said whenever you're using that regenerative braking it almost slows the car all the way down it's only until you get to the last few feet or the last few mile per hour that's the only time that you actually feel the brakes grab and engage but the electric motor is doing majority of the braking trying to recoup recoup some of that energy but it's still slowing you down in a safe manner but there are sometimes like i said it's unpredictable and you're like you know, you're thinking that it's going to slow down more, slow down faster, and then you come up on the car and it's like, oh shit, but, you know, you still have the regular brakes there. So, um, that's, uh, I wouldn't say it's unsettling, but after driving the car a few months, you start feeling more comfortable and, and, and you change your driving habits to maximize uh, regenerative braking and not having to rely or use the brakes as often. Now on the downside of that is uh, sometimes the regenerative braking can be a little bit aggressive and so the thing is when you're driving in low and you're using regenerative braking it doesn't activate the brakes it doesn't I mean it doesn't activate the brake light so when you have other people that don't really look at the car but look at your brake lights to to indicate when they should brake also it's actually it's kind of a safety hazard because like I said driving in low I can take my foot off the accelerator pedal and the car will slow down to where you actually feel the G's of you slowing down. But it's apparently it's still under a threshold where the car manufacturers don't have to engage the brake lights. Now there's the, the BMW i3 that when the regenerative braking is so aggressive that if you if you're driving in the if you're driving in low and you remove your foot from the accelerator pedal it'll it'll activate the brake lights because their regen is a lot stronger and after a certain g-force it'll activate it's a certain deceleration and a certain period of time um that they can get away with not having brake lights so um like i said though there's times where cars have been following me or tailgating me and i react to traffic ahead of me and i slow down but not hit the brake and you see them come up so so hard or end up breaking hard 
because um, because they they're looking for your brake lights. They're not looking at the car. They're looking for your brake lights. So you know, I wouldn't say that. I mean, yeah, there's been instances where I've almost been rear-ended, and here's a good example of what happened to me when I was descending descending the grades in Gatlinburg, there was a, a, I think it was like a Ford Expedition or Explorer that was behind me. And so I'm, I'm carving through the hills, not tapping the brakes. I'm just, you know, using regen, letting it slow me down and accelerating out of the corners. And so, you know, when I, accel when I, when I, you let, when I use regenerative braking and let it slow me down going into a corner this car the the expedition was coming up on me super fast and then it was like breaking at the last minute and uh so it kept doing that and the more and more it kept doing that the more and more i saw it back off and try to distance itself away from me and then it got to the point where it just pulled off uh, let another car pass and got behind that car and i was like i know exactly what he's doing he can't well, I mean, some of these grades will, you know, if you're not paying attention or you take the corner too fast, you're going to kill yourself, go into oncoming traffic or run into the wall. So that person couldn't gauge how to brake while following me because my car is handling the curves great. But you, when you have a big top heavy SUV and you're not braking like you should, you're not using your own thoughts or your own mind to calculate your braking distance but you're relying on the car in front of you you can't do that following a chevy you know a chevy vote you know unless unless that person is conditioned to use the brakes in the chevy vote to where it activates the brake light it just leaves the the drivers behind you guessing and there's been complaints on the forums that you know they should update the software or something or have some type of fix but but it's still under that threshold it's no different than a a stick shift car downshifting and you getting getting that sudden deceleration it still falls well with um, under the parameters actually a car downshifting has more deceleration than the Chevy Volt does so they don't see the reason why they should do any firmware upgrades or make any modifications to how the car brakes um, so I, all right so I know I danced around a little bit uh, but going to the total range of the car like like I said earlier, the electric range can range from 25, 30 miles as high as 45 miles, and then the the gasoline range it has about a nine to nine and a half gallon tank. The combined electric and gasoline ranges, I've in my personal experience, I've gotten up to 420 miles on gasoline and electric combined, but of course whenever you're on a road trip and you can't recharge you lose 40 miles of that so the realistic gas range is 380 miles on on gas only and that's based on 38 39 40 mile per gallon it's, it's just all like I said, all these numbers are rough estimates uh people's mileage may vary but that's how much i've seen while driving and like i said i've seen the worst end of it and I've seen the best end of it. So like worst case scenario, you're going to see maybe 340. Best case scenario, you're going to see up to uh, 380. And with EV and um, EV and gas combined, the best case scenario is about 420 miles. And um, like I said, right now with, uh, with the gas prices being as low as they are, it's costing me about... 20 to 25 dollars to fill up the car and i might fill it up once a month most of my errands are around i'll say 10 to 15 miles for most of my errands and then even if i had to go to the other side of atlanta use my ev range and then i might end up using 10 or 15 miles gas range on top of that this car really shines when you can keep your trips under 80 to 100 miles it's the best vehicle because when you look at the combined miles per gallon rating for uh your gas and electric under 100 miles there's really not too many cars that can match that now if you're you have more than 100 miles then the prius ends up kind of being a better option after a certain mileage you know because it can take regular gas and i think in some places regular gas right now is like a dollar and 80 cents 
Uh, where I'm at is about 215, but still it's pretty cheap and it almost has the same size gas tank. Some people are saying they're only getting 400 miles, 450 miles of the Prius. I, you know, I would be one of those people that try to hyper mile that car and be looking to get 50 or 60, you know, miles per gallon out of it. I know, um, Neptronics or, uh, or Dave, Dave, um, David Silverman has an insight and he says he has a first generation insight and he's saying that he's getting up to 60 miles per gallon on that and even higher depending. But when you look at the cost savings, buying a Chevy Volt new, it doesn't make any sense. But I bought mines used. I bought mines for 15.7, which is a freaking steal because I think one reason why mines was so low because you have the tax cuts. Like Georgia had a tax cut and there was a federal tax cut. The car originally cost anywhere between, you know, thirty-five to $40,000 and it just, the payback on it buying it new it just doesn't make any sense but when you get it used at around 15 7 it's a no-brainer go ahead and get it the payback on it would be so so great and i've actually used this car more on electric than i have gas and i've gone out of town four or five times this year but yet my electric range is still pretty uh pretty high in comparison to what i've used on gas and also going into the maintenance of the vehicle i've done eight or nine thousand miles and my back and my oil life is at 75 percent you're looking at once a year oil changes and that's just to keep things fresh in the car but it, you know if the car is telling me that i got 80 percent left and when i bought the car they did a fresh oil change i'm going to go with what the book says and what the manual says and trust the you know trust the vehicle now i've had other cars where i know i need to really religiously um change them out every three to five thousand miles but when you look at you know how often the gasoline is gasoline engine is running and how much you're on electric and how there aren't a lot of it's still a motor but there aren't a lot of moving parts and i'm reading people getting up to two hundred thousand miles without any uh without any service any major service or any major problems that's pretty uh, that's pretty good. On another note, the 20, 2010 to 2012, they definitely are older cars and they had older firmware that Chevy hasn't updated because the newer votes, they pretty much have the same dash, but they're, the newer votes have a newer dash, but the whole user interface is totally different. The newer interface gives you a lot more information. It gives you uh, output power, input energy recovery uh they also have a hold mode um the older ones don't have a hold mode and basically what this hold mode does is if you're going to be on a long trip and you want to save your ev range for riding around in the city you can basically put the car in a hold mode and it'll just use the gasoline motor right out the gate to, and save that charge until you get to your destination and then you take the hold mode off and then you can um use your 40 miles of ev range your 40 or 50 miles of ev range when you get to your destination the older volts they don't have a hold mode but like i said you can still use that mountain mode and that mountain mode like i said it holds anywhere between 10 to 15 miles range and so when you get to your destination you'll take mountain mode off and then you can ride around 10 or 15 miles on ev range and pretty neat because um, it seems like an ev mode is and especially in a lower pace city where the speed limits are 25, 35, the vote really shines at that speed. So even though it says only 10 or 15 miles, you can get almost 20 to 25, depending on how you're driving. So it's not like totally crippling that the older votes don't have the hold mode. Um, like I said, we have a pseudo hold mode. That's the one thing that the newer votes have that the older volts don't is the is the hold mode also the newer volts have slightly larger battery packs with the older volts we had a 16 kilowatt hour battery pack in the 2011 and 2012 and the 2013 2014 they increased this to 16.5 and the 2015 they had increased this to 17.1 so the later volts do have a larger ev range than the older ones uh, due to the increased battery pack size um, 
And so what this translates to is the 2012 only uh, gets 35 miles. That's the only what they only, I wouldn't say they guarantee 35 miles, but that's what the EPA rating is, is uh, 35 miles for the 2011, 2012, 38 miles for the 2013, 2014, and up to 52 miles for the newer one that's going to be released in 2016 so and I actually think that you know the 2016 vote that's the if the price was right that would be the one to get because even looking at me I don't have a nine to five I work from home but still there are just some areas and stuff that goes on the higher end of that range and if I had 10 or 15 more miles of extra range I could do almost solely all of my errands on EV only now going to um, I'm going to charging right now the car comes with a 120 volt compatible charger where you can use a regular wall outlet and charge your car but this this charger is only now the car can charge on 120 but the charger is uh, limited to basically that home circuit which is about 1.5 kilowatt or it might be a little bit slightly higher uh, a little bit slightly higher but it's realistically let's use like 1500 watts as the maximum that you can normally pull from uh, a 120 outlet so that's 120 volts at 15 amps now to to charge the battery on 120 it takes anywhere between 8 to 10 hours which is totally fine whenever you're overnight charging um, but for me that was painfully slow I mean because basically you have one one time during the day to charge the battery uh, which was at night and so you know during the day what if you had multiple areas what if you went to the grocery store came back home dropped your groceries off and had to go to a doctor's appointment um, it just doesn't allow for a speedy recovery of your your EV range because I think it was basically about three to four miles per hour that you would gain using 120 so what I ended up doing was I found uh, a, a person that sold the Nissan Leaf um, the Nissan Leaf chargers and so what they've done to the Nissan Leaf chargers they changed out a few components and allow it to use 240 uh, so right now I have a Nissan it seems like blasphemy I have a Nissan charger that's rated for 3.3 kilowatt hours because the internal the internal um, onboard charger is limited to 3.3 so I'm maximizing the internal onboard charger and so it does 240 at 20 amps or 15 to 20 amps and so that allows me to charge the car in three and a half to four hours and that's a lot more respectable because I can go out in the morning six or eight o'clock do all of my errands come home uh, around 10 and fully charge my car up in three to four hours and still go back out later on that evening so you really could push this car to almost between 70 to 90 miles of EV range per day if you set aside the hours to charge um, I mean but it's still you're not stranded I mean you still have gasoline but it's still you know you want to be a purist you want to be green so you want to try to do most of your errands on EV range as much as possible and you know like I said 120 is great if you're fine with overnight charging you just have that one errand per day but you know sometimes I'll do my own errands and then my wife comes home and you know we'll take the car out and go out to dinner or go out and do a few other things and that will put me over that that EV range that I initially stored that previous night so the so the 120 is 8 to 10 hours charging time and um, the 220 or 240 is about three and a half to four hours charge time and these are wired cords so um, that's a uh, that's one thing and you have to worry about especially with the portable cord you have to worry about you know sometimes somebody might want to steal the cord for the copper or whatever of course I live right down the street from I wouldn't say one of the roughest neighborhoods in Atlanta but you know people come up and do petty stuff like that they may cut your cord or something like that and steal the cord or unplug the car but 
luckily uh, some of these handles the handles that actually the charge handles that actually goes into the car they have locks on them to where you can put little luggage locks to where they can't remove it from the car um, while you're charging and then also the car has the feature if, it's the, if the plug is removed and it's still charging or even when it's not charging if the plug is removed from the car the car will alarm letting you know that something's happening with your charge cord and everything and also the car is linked with OnStar so you will get alerts from the car that lets you know that hey you forgot to plug in your car your car is fully charged or you know or you can override it remotely and tell it to charge like you can set a schedule on the car and tell it to charge between certain time periods due to your electric rates like my electric rates I can charge at pretty much any time outside the hours of 2 to 7 and I'm pretty good um, but if I charge during the hours of 2 to 7 my rate is like I will say six times higher than what it is on the other hours um, the charge cost for my car is roughly about if you look at the actual raw rate of the car uh, it's about 16 cents because I'm paying 0, 0.0 I'm paying a fraction of a cent I'm paying 0. 0.9 cents a kilowatt hour so it will take roughly about 9 to 10 cents to charge my car during the off-peak time now if you factor in all the fees and everything else I think this number is close to 9 or 9 nine or ten cents a kilowatt hour so if you look at the raw cost is ten cents nine to ten cents if you look at the actual cost after fees uh, it may be a little bit closer to uh, I would say maybe a dollar maybe yeah it would be closer to a dollar to charge up the car for 40 miles um, so you really can't complain about that but most municipal places have several different rate plans for um for electricity like i said i'm using one to where i can't use any heavy loads at the same time that means if i'm running you know running the ac and the dishwasher is a no-no or running the dryer and the dishwasher is a no-no you either pick one or you pick the other and so as long as I can keep my peak usage down that's good and then also if I don't use anything between the hours of 2 to 7 p.m. which is my high on peak rate and that rate is almost um, 20 to 30 cents depending on which plan I'm on uh, 20 to 30 cents a kilowatt hour so um, there are times where if if you can't convert yourself to live the lifestyle and be an EV purist and pay attention to your um, how much electricity you're using this can turn out bad for you but on the other hand you know it can work out pretty good now here's another thing that people don't really know about the Chevy Volt is that the car you know the car does have a 16 kilowatt hour battery pack but the car also has a 250 amp inverter where it takes the 360 volt battery and converts it to 12 volts for the other battery that's in the car the car does have a 12 volt battery but what this means is in case there's a power failure or anything if you have a pure sine wave inverter that's anywhere between one to about 1000 to 1500 watts you can put that inverter in the car and run your house or appliances for about I would say maybe a day or two off the car battery alone and then after that uh, the car will come on it'll, the car will crank up and run for like maybe 10 or 15 minutes every hour to top off the battery and then it'll just shut off and whenever the load increases or whatever it'll just run the car to maintain the load but you know when you have generators that run just 20 24 7 or just run for the allotted time even though there's a load or no load is wasting gas you know but the Chevy Volt can just basically crank up store enough of energy and then shut off 
So then once once the energy that it just stored gets depleted, it'll just crank up. And so you may have it crank up maybe once or twice an hour to generate that one one to two kilowatt hours of power um, in that time frame and store it on the main battery and it'll just cut off. So uh, that's a that's a good added feature that people don't know they can do with the Chevy Volt and the Leafs. The Leafs can do the same thing. You know, if you need power in a pinch and all the lights are out and you know it's a natural disaster and you might not have power for several hours, you know, just go ahead and get the get an inverter wired up in the in your in your vehicle and you can use your car as battery power. But like I said, I like the added fact that, you know, I have my battery and then I also have the gas generator. So as long as I have gas in the tank and um and a full battery I should be able to, you know, survive for at least a week and some change and so also it makes the, the car a good candidate for camping so if you know you're just camping one night and you're doing the I guess what they call the, the high class camping where you bring radios and TVs and lights and everything out the car could support you for the night and you can be comfortable so um, that's another thing to look at another hidden fact is like this car was supposed to be a five-seater but due to the battery going down the center of the car and the battery height being high, they had to omit the, the third seat that's in the rear. So it's like all of them are bucket seats pretty much. But since there's that center console where the battery is, they had to omit the seat in the rear. The one thing the car has a windskirt that's supposed to reduce drag and increase the aerodynamic profile or whatever whenever you're on the highway. But this this little windscreen it scrapes on everything whenever you're pulling in the driveways when you're pulling out of driveways uh heaven forbid there be something in the road like a dead animal or something it just pretty much hits everything and so they do have a low profile and a high profile wind skirt that you know you know if you need the extra clearance you put the shorter one the shorter low profile one on there if you really don't if it really doesn't matter to you and you live in Kansas and everything is flat um, then do the high one I mean do the regular size high one um, I don't know how much of a difference it makes in the miles per gallon but they do have those options available I just recently put a hitch on my car to to haul my bike and so you know with most hitches you got to be careful where you pull in and pull out of because there may be uh, a chance of that hitch scraping the ground, especially when pulling out of driveways or backing out of driveways. The car does sit pretty low to the ground. So that's something else to think about. Under the hood, there's really nothing much to look at. You have the top of the motor, the motor cover, and then you'll have uh, basically the, I guess, the motor controller or the, the motor controller and all the electronics for the motor, the, the 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 onboard charger, and everything, but um, there really isn't much to look at under the hood. One thing that you'll notice under the hood that it has two cooling systems. So one is for the the gas motor, and one is for the battery pack. Now after after the car gets done charging, you will hear fans and stuff rev up. I guess uh you know it's like the onboard balancer you know kicking in and getting rid of some of the excess energy and it also could be tied into uh, since the batteries were charging at such a high rate that the cells might be warmed up a little bit so you know it circulates coolant through the battery to get rid of that excess of heat it's really really subtle some people are like oh it sounds so loud whenever whenever the fans are on at the end of charge or whatever Oh, it sounds so loud, but it's not really it's not really that loud. Um, also, you like the AC since the, the AC pretty much runs on an electric motor. So, whenever you're on EV only mode, you and you're driving around, you'll hear something spinning under the hood, and that's just an electric motor turning the compressor. This car does not have a spare tire. It does include one of those air pumps that have you know some weird tire seal it in there and so you pump that in the tire and um and put some air in it and it supposedly seals the tire but yeah it doesn't have 
It doesn't have a spare tire, although it looks like there is room under the car for a spare tire. Uh, but since I put my hitch there, it pretty much eliminated that space. But um, this car is so heavy because you got 500, well, it's like 440 pounds worth of battery. And then you have the electric motor, then you have the electric, um, you have the second cooling system, you have, you know, the gas weight in there, and then you also, um, you also have, like I said, the gas motor and the electric motor. So it, this car is a very, very heavy vehicle. And so you can tell in certain areas where they try to, you know, wouldn't say cut corners, but pretty much the whole body is plastic. You knock on it, it's definitely not metal, it's plastic. I don't think there's one body panel on that car except for maybe the roof. Everything else is plastic. You know, the metal might be roof, certain door jams, and you know, the, 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 the unit body of the car is metal, but the doors, the hood, the fenders, the, you know, the bumpers and all of that, all of that is plastic. So, you know, they have this extra weight and they try to shave it wherever possible. You look under the car, the car looks pretty simple. The battery is well protected by, you know, some type of skid plate or something. I'm pretty sure the battery just drops out from under the vehicle. Um, but it does look like it has a nice skid plate, so even if you hit like something nasty and you decide to hop a curve or something like that and you think you're going to scrape the bottom of your car, everything is pretty much tucked away to where nothing should snag or anything. It looks well designed up under the car. Um, the car, it, the, the handling of the car is pretty tight. Uh, to where you know you can make U-turns and pretty much almost stay you know you don't have to swing out so wide it doesn't turn so wide to where it's like has the illusion that it's a big body car it's pretty it's pretty nimble but you do feel the weight of the car and the curves but the thing is the car has such a low center of gravity you feel the weight of the car but it doesn't have that body roll it's a wide vehicle and it doesn't have that body body roll and has a slow center of gravity to where uh, it, it actually hugs curves pretty well. I mean, I don't feel unsafe or feel like I'm a skid off the road or anything um, whenever I'm driving it, you know, but like I said, it is a heavy vehicle. It's much heavier than regular, regular cars that come in around 2,500, 3,000 pounds. This one is uh, the weight is up in 3,700, but it's pretty close to 4,000 when most other cars are well below that. They're probably like almost 1,000 pounds lighter. I also, uh, I didn't touch on the heating and the cooling. Like I said, the car, car does have a, air, you know, a standard AC compressor and it's driven by electric motors, but it also has an electric heater too. And so the electric heater, oh man, that thing sucks some balls. So... The electric heater is sort of like almost like a quartz heater, but for, or a nick chrome or some type of element type heater. And, you know, it's, it's something about electric heat where you know that smell is so distinct. Uh, but the thing is, the car is so, um, the car is so tied in with everything. It monitors all your power drain and everything. So whenever you're using heat, and you look at how much power is drawing it gives you on the screen it gives you an estimate on how much power of the battery is actually being used to heat the vehicle and this can get like super high like you know 60 70 percent but it's one of those values that tapers off so as you approach your temperature it uses less and less power and then once it finally gets up to temperature it just only just subtly you know is not drawing a lot of power to maintain that temperature but if you get in your car and it's like freezing outside and you expect the electric heater to warm you up in a, any sensible time frame it's not going to happen you know it's it's going to be one of those things that will finally get warm when you get there and like i said yeah you can push the, you can push the system if you really didn't care about your range and you just go into the grocery store which is five ten miles on that five or ten miles away sure crank it on up and just blow your wad and get the car get the car warm but uh, you know when you try to use the economy settings or try to be frugal and try to heat the car 
but not use so much of the battery power that you lose five ten miles of range because trust me you will lose five ten miles of range at the peak of summer i was losing about 20 almost 20 percent of my range just to cool the car in the 90 something degree heat you know so it, the, the heating and cooling does take a, t a toll on the battery life but when it's when it gets to a certain temperature to where it's so low um one thing that it does do is instead of it consuming all of your battery power what it does it'll crate the car up and heat up the electric i mean it'll crate the car up one to heat the batteries uh it'll it'll run the engine the engine will generate heat it'll circulate It'll circulate that coolant through the batteries to warm them up to to get them to a temperature to where they can provide you know a decent range the colder the battery is the less range it's going to provide the warmer the battery is the more range that it'll provide but also this is used to supplement the heating in the car if it's too low it'll crank the engine up to supplement the heating on the car um and you know circulate the coolant so it's a dual thing it has an electric heater but it still also has uh, a heater core and it still it changes it changes it I mean so it's not like if it's cold that is just running all the time it just it runs it it gets it up the temperature and it just basically steals the heat from the motor and the, and the, and the electric I mean the gas motor cuts off and it just cuts on periodically just to you know warm the fluids up a little bit more to help you maintain uh, the battery temp and the cabin temp but also the car has um has built in like if you're charging the car on 240 or even on 120 as long as that car is plugged into the house you can either use onstar remote link and remote start the car to heat it or cool it before you actually get in it and any energy that is needed to heat the car will be pulled from the grid or be pulled through the charger or basically you'll be drawing power from the house to heat the car cool the car and then once you unplug the, the cable then it just switches over the battery to maintain that climate temperature so in a way i think that's cool you know that can definitely help you reduce uh, uh that can definitely help you keep your range up when you ever if you ever use this car for commuting uh, it can help you keep your range up to something respectable but uh i i don't know what to expect during this winter time like i said i was getting in the spring when i bought the car in march or april i was getting you know 38 30 miles on a charge uh during the summer that dropped off to the low 30s like 30 32 and right now it's finally climbing back up i'm sitting around um 35 36 i'm pretty sure by um october november i'll probably climb back up to uh the high 30s 38 39 40 and then once Atlanta gets cool again, um, then I can probably give you more feedback on how the car reacts with uh, the heating system. Like I said, I'm telling you some of this stuff based on me playing around with the heating and stuff when I first got the car. Um, I'm giving you real world estimates based on my spring, summer, and early fall, but I haven't quite got into the winter sector yet. But I'm like I said, I'm expecting. Well, the battery power to tank to like 25, 30, one because it just simply needs to warm up the batteries to get it, to get it up to temperature to where they can perform a little bit better, and then also due to the heating, you know, um, the heating aspect and ha it having to use either the, it, like I said, it'll either burn the gas or it'll use the electric onboard heater to uh, heat up the vehicle. Now the later models or the higher end models that have GPS navigation and all of that, they have seat warmers and so you can still turn on the heat but basically they will rather, it's more efficient for the car to push more power to the seat warmers which may be using maybe 5 amps or something like that to heat your butt and your body versus it having to dump 10, 20 amps into uh, a heating element. And so your body, you know, it's your body acts as an insulator, and when you warm your core, you actually hold on to heat, and you you're not really that sensitive to temperature change when you have a seat warmer versus trying to heat the heat or cool the air that's around you. 
So that's another thing that you have to look at. And my final verdict, like I said, if you had to, you know, look at the Chevy Volt, you have to look at how many miles you're doing a day. What are your errands like? If your errands are under 40 miles, um, then you may want to consider it. If your total commute one way is under 80 miles or 100 miles, then the vote is still a good competitor. If it's over 100 miles, then you may want to look into a Prius. But also, buying a vote new, it just doesn't make sense to buy a vote new, but buying one used like I did, then it's a no-brainer. Uh, I'll, you know, I bought my car, it was, I bought my car in 2015, this is a 2012, it was fresh off a of lease, the car was very clean, it had 36, 37,000 miles on it, so they did put on the appropriate miles for the lease that they were in, and I've had, you know, no problems, and I expect to have no problems as long as I just do, you know, get my eventual oil change sometime in the next year and then you know just keep the fluids up and keep the tire pressure and everything you know where it should be now these also i forgot to mention the tires the, the tires are i wouldn't say they're a special compound tire but they're definitely an ev an ev tire and they run this the manual tells you to run about 38 psi in them and it has a the, the the car has a tire pressure monitoring system you just scroll through the dash and you can see what the tire pressure is on all the wheels um some people are running as high as 42 45 um just to try to reduce the rolling resistance and try to get more um get more EV range out of it. People with the Priuses have done the same thing. They increased the PSI of the tires to help with rolling resistance. I'm not sure how much the tires cost, but I'm pretty sure they're probably one of those $150, $200 tires that are the super hard, low resistance compound um, that that just grip really well and, you know, and they last a long time. Like I said, the, this car still has the original tires on it and the the tires look brand new so like i said i'm pretty sure the that they're an ev tire that's that hard compound to wear you know they just have better better wear better roller resistance and all of that also on the earlier models of the car there was a, a wind buffeting issue so when you roll down the windows you have this uh, i guess it's like a percussion there's like a loud buffeting noise when you have all the windows rolled down or especially it's really bad when you only have two windows rolled down and basically what's going on is the wind is being the wind is something's happening with the wind and the mirrors and so um there's an option to where it's a it's a dealer free upgrade to where you can go to the dealership and have your mirrors replaced and and it'll eliminate that noise or definitely reduce it to something that's like, okay, that's regular wind noise. But whenever you're rolling down or rolling up the windows, it, it's almost like it, it, it does something like, it like pressurizes the car. It sounds like, wah, 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 wah. Like, so it sounds really, sounds really bad. Um, but, you know, most of the times, it's like, it's really pronounced with two windows. The front windows that's normally causing most of the noise the back windows don't really cause it uh, so that's another thing to look out for but it's a dealer free you just go to the dealer and say hey I want the mirror upgrades the the, the side view mirror upgrades to reduce the buffeting noise and they'll swap it out for free but you got to be careful I haven't done it because I don't like taking my car to the dealership because you know they I just really don't like dealing with dealership, dealerships in general, but um, some people say they have problems whenever, especially if you have like a really, really fancy color or something, they have to paint the mirrors to the color of your car and you can lose your car for like almost a week due to them ordering the part, painting the part, and then 
installing it. Thank you for listening to this podcast. If you, if you have any other have questions on the Chevy Volt, please leave them down in the comment the box below. Good if you have that, any suggestions you know, for future them topics for future podcasts, right, you know, please, please leave those time, in the so comment box below also. Otherwise, stay safe and stay charged.